introduce you to a friend of mine who I've known for many years, more years than I care to say. I will not call him an old friend because when you get to our age, you don't talk about old. You say, dear friend, friend of long standing, but you never say old friend. This is Sam Edgerton. Uh, I uh, came to know him as Elder Edgerton at the Emmanuel Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church in Buffalo, New York. And uh, uh, he called me the other day. He, he sort of keeps in touch with my sister, who's still in Buffalo. And she let him know that we were here. And I'd actually forgot that you were here in Phoenix, because we've you know, been separated for such a long time. But uh, when we were all young and wild, it was people like Elder Edison that kept us kind of on the straight and narrow. <laughs> so it's good to see, good to see you. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yes, very much so. So we praise the Lord. Good to have you here, man. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have on 3ABN before each nightly broadcast a program called Eyesight Review. It is called Eyesight Review because uh, it is shot on iPhone. It is a, a program that has any number of small testimonies, usually two to three minutes in length. Um, on last night, I think the pastor was on, and tonight, uh, Elder Randy and Kathy are on. We're looking for human interest stories. If you came to the Lord, or your first contact with Adventism was through 3ABN, we'd like to get you on that program. It won't be long. The pain and torture will not be long. Just three minutes. And before you know it, it will be done. The elder did a fine job. Kathy did a fine job. The pastor did a fine job. His wife uh, was not there. And... Uh, <laughs> So if, if, if you fall into that category or uh, have a particularly strong testimony, would you see my wife, Irma, if you will stand for the one or two people who may not know you? Uh, and then we will we'll do a little something after because every night we're trying to fill this program with human interest stories from the five churches that are running the meetings. And uh, we would certainly like to have you on. Um, uh, Television is not that frightening. Only maybe a million, million and a half people will see you. <laughs> It's not, um, actually, it's more than that. It's, it's 700 million, so. Um, but after the first 10 or 12,000, you don't even see the rest, so don't worry about that. Uh, but if you have a, a human interest story, a story of redemption coming to the Lord, then please, we'd like to um, include you on eyesight review. Um, how many have been blessed by the meetings thus far? Have you learned a little something or maybe, be, maybe been reintroduced to something that perhaps you've known and... Uh, Maybe in your travels, uh, it has slipped your mind. Tonight, we want to talk about the book that breathes. The book that breathes. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we praise you and thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet. We thank you for the light that shines in the pathway that is illuminated by your word. Please, dear Lord, would it please you to come again into our hearts and into our minds as we study your word, as we re-consecrate and dedicate ourselves to you, our Alpha and our Omega. Be the teacher this night and make up for the deficiencies of the human instrument with divine grace Amen. that we might see and know Jesus. Amen. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The book that breathes. The Bible, dare I say, is a unique, in fact, the most <coughs> unique book ever penned by man. Amen. The Bible is a living word. Now, I'm going to come back to that again. It is a living word. I have read and have in my possession the Mishnah, which is the oral traditions of the Hebrew economy written down. I've got the Torah, which I've read, which are the first five books of the Bible. I've got the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. There are two. I've got the Tanakh. And when you say Tanakh, you have to say Tanakh. <laughs> Most say Tanakh. That's the wrong book. The Tanakh. The Tanakh is the Old Testament. I've got a catechism. I've got a Koran. 
And I have somewhere in the neighborhood, my wife will attest, about 40 Bibles. I didn't buy all of those Bibles. Uh, people seem to run out of gift ideas uh, when you're the pastor. Oh, it's the pastor's birthday. I know. Let's get him a Bible. It's the pastor's first anniversary. Oh, I know. Let's get him a Bible. It's his wedding anniversary. Let's get his and her Bibles. And so having pastors seven or eight churches, uh, averaging two Bibles per church, I got about 40 now, including the ones I've bought myself. I've got a Greek New Testament, a couple of those. I've got a Hebrew uh, Greek translation. I've got a Hebrew Greek interlinear. And I've got even a, a Kabbalah. Now, Kabbalah is, is Jewish mysticism. I don't read that too much, and I don't suggest you read it. Kabbalah is the, the mystic aspect of Judaism, the sort of new age, old age Judaism. Kabbalah is not something you really want to uh, mess with too much. Uh, uh, so you want to sort of stay with But I have one uh, because it was there and I just got it. <laughs> but the Bible is a living word. It is most commonly sold as a single book, sometimes as two books, Old and New Testament. The Gideons sometimes, and I checked my hotel room, the Gideons have slipped one there in our hotel and usually find Gideon Bibles in all of the hotel rooms. It is, in fact, and most of you know and understand this, 66 separate works written over a span of 1,500 years by 35 authors. The language of the Bible is, for the most part, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It is, ah, I know it's not working. I have to turn it on. There you go. 66 books written over 1,500 years. 35 authors. Um, there are ancient artifacts that attest to the reality, the authenticity of the Bible. They include the Moabite stone, the Rosetta stone, and of course the Dead Sea Scrolls. I have been to Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls are or were discovered in 1947. They contain parts of every book in the Bible except the book of, anybody know? Esther, correct. And when you see where those caves are, uh, it is amazing that they were ever discovered. But they are there, and we have a Bible tour that we take every year with uh, Pastor Gilly. And uh, we always go by Qumran because it's fascinating to see how those books lay undisturbed for so many thousands of years until they were discovered in 1947. There have been any number of so-called learned men who have tried and taken pot shots at the word of God. But brothers and sisters, the Bible still stands. It is authentic. It is historically accurate. Those who tried to say it was not were befuddled when science stepped up to confirm the Bible. Archaeology stepped up to confirm the Bible. History itself stepped up to confirm the Bible. Linguistics stepped up to confirm the Bible. It is the word of God. Amen. Notice that the Bible does not seek to defend itself. There's no word about the word it defends itself. The Bible says, Barashith, bara Elohim. In the beginning, God doesn't try to explain it, doesn't try to rationalize it. Either you accept that, or you might as well close the book. Amen? Amen. In the beginning, God. Either that is true, or it is not. Or if I was in the hood, I'd say either it is, or it ain't. But you've got to set that because everything else in the Bible is based on the fact that in the beginning, God. Quick fact, the Bible ranged from, in its writing from the 3rd century B.C. all the way to 70 A.D. 
As I said before, Hebrew, 15% Aramaic, a little Greek. And if you have books like Daniel, Daniel is written in three languages. It is, it is chiastic, and I don't have time to go into that term. It simply means the, the meat is in the middle. Uh, but it has Hebrew, Aramaic, and then at the end, there's more Hebrew. So the meat is in the middle. Uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Hebrew, all in the same book. The consistency of the Bible is remarkable. That so many men could write over such an extended period of time. And ladies and gentlemen, the Bible does not contradict itself. Amen. 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 It is its own best expositor. And when you have a question about the Bible, the best place to get an answer for your question is guess where? The Bible itself. It always explains itself. There are thousands of references to the Bible that declare its inspiration, and history confirms its accuracy, the rise and fall of nations, one of the most astounding aspects of the Bible is its prophetic accuracy. Because it wasn't just written by men. It was penned by men, but it wasn't written by them. They just penned it. It came from God through his Holy Spirit. Holy men writing under the divine influence and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, in a minute, I'm going to remind some of you of something I said the other night that may surprise some of you, but it's a very interesting sideline or sidelight from the Word of God. The Bible is a testament to the love and reclaiming power of God. You see, the men who wrote the Bible were not perfect. Amen. Amen. And I am so glad that God does not wait for us to get perfect. Amen. Amen. Before he calls us and before he uses us. Amen. You've got some very imperfect people mm -hmm. <laughs> who are members of the church of God. And what we ought to remember every time somebody steps on your toes is that they are not perfect. And neither, mm -hmm. neither are you. Yeah. Church is a hospital for sinners. If you were perfect, you wouldn't need God and you wouldn't need the church. But surprise, surprise, you ain't. And neither am I. Amen. Amen. We're, we're getting there. Amen. And I hope when Christ comes back to be there. What about you? But I'm not perfect yet. No. Neither are you. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. Yeah. Not perfect yet. Working on it. And every now and again, the Lord allows the devil to show me, me. Amen. And I'm forced to the realization that I'm not quite as perfect as I thought I was. Amen. Amen. And God wants you to know that. He already knows that. Amen. Amen. He wants you to know it so that you can work with him on being perfected. Amen? Amen. And one of the things the Word of God does, it shows us our imperfections. It really does. I see our friend is back. Divine inspiration is the secret of the accuracy of the Word of God. The other key is Jesus. It predicts Jesus' first coming. It describes Jesus' life and ministry. And it gives us the certainty of the fact that Jesus is coming again. Amen. So let us look at some scriptures that bespeak that truth. 
Again, we told you. Oh, I, I didn't say this. Koine Greek. You know that term? Koine Greek. Koine Greek. The coin, word koine means common, or what we call street Greek. The Greek in the New Testament is not PhD, summa cum laude Greek. It's street Greek. And that's why when you are translating the Bible, you have to be very careful about the terminology because any street language has a lot of jargon in it. You know what I mean by jargon? Street stuff. It's like I, I sometimes study Spanish out of a book and then go to Panama with my wife and don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> because they're, they're speaking colloquial. You know, you, there's that street, like, like you, you, you could say, C.A. Murray is out to lunch. Now, that could mean a number of things. That could mean I'm gone to have lunch, or it could mean he's out to lunch. <laughs> that, that's a colloquialism. And the New Testament has a lot of that stuff in it. So when you are translating the New Testament, you've got to be very, very careful. You've got to ask five questions. That's four, five. <laughs> Who said it? What did they say? What did they mean? What did the people who they were speaking to understand it to mean? Then what does it mean to me? And you'll find a lot of preachers that you watch on TV or listen to or you know, don't ask those questions. They can't and, and come up with some of those explanations. Who said it? Who was the person? Was he Jew? Was he Arab? Was he uh, infidel? Was he proselyte? What did he say? Then what did that mean? He's out to lunch. Well, it may mean he's out to lunch. <laughs> what did the people who were listening to him understand it to mean? And then you make the translation application to us today. Does that make sense? And every time you try to do exegesis, which is biblical explanation, you've got to ask those five questions before you can presume to know what the Bible is trying to say. Amen. All right. I love this text. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But they used their own language to explain those thoughts. It's if... If I'm preaching, I may say something a certain way. If Elder Randy's preaching, he may say something a certain way. If Pastor Stephen's preaching, he may say the same thing, but use different terminology because of your background. So you speak in, in words that are comfortable to you, but they are expressing design, divine thoughts. Make sense? So it's not the words per se that are divine. It's the thought that has been inspired. You may say, God is great. Or you may say, God is fantastic. God is wonderful. All expressing the same thought, but using different languages. So don't get hung up so much on the words. That it's the thought that is inspired by God. Spoken through humans to express divine thoughts to other humans. Here's my text. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture. How much? All. All. The parts you like? <laughs> no. All. Including the stuff you don't like. The stuff that steps on your toes. The stuff that tells you you can't eat everything. And we're not there yet, so I'll save that for another night. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine are those teachings that instruct and inform how you're supposed to behave. Doctrine, those things, those statements that inform your life and how you're supposed to act. Amen. That's what doctrine is. For reproof. Reproof are those words that tell you you're going the wrong way. Amen. Amen. The part we really love. For correction. See, it's not enough to tell you you're going wrong. You got to tell me how to go right. Amen? You, it's not to say, bad child, bad child, bad child, bad child, bad child. Sometimes you got to add a little encouragement in there, don't you? Yeah. So the Bible will tell you when you're doing wrong, but it also is very quick to tell you when you're doing right. Amen? And for instruction in righteousness, how that right living, right acting, leads to righteousness. Amen? Amen? 
Really a fabulous, fabulous text. Think what life would be like if everyone lived by the Bible. Think about that. Think what life would be like if we all lived by the Bible. Wouldn't that be something? You know, I was in prison. I wasn't in prison. I was doing prison ministry. Amen. There is a difference. We have a show uh, that I produce uh, and created called Free Indeed on 3ABN. And um, I made that statement one day. And um, I said, what would it be like if everybody lived by the Bible? And somebody from the back said, boring. This is prison. You're talking about boring. And then, um, by the way, I ended up baptizing that guy. Yeah, yeah. I said, obviously you haven't seen some of the things that I have seen. I've been holding on to this for two nights. I want to go into the story now. I want you to look at this. I showed this to Randy. I think I showed it to Pastor. This is a bumper sticker that I pulled off, that I stole off of a car 40 years ago this year. I stole it. Buff no, it was Buffalo. It was after Buffalo. It was in New York City. It says, get it through your head, Jesus is dead. Yeah. And when I saw this bumper sticker, I had to have it. It was the Friday evening before Mother's Day in 1978. I was driving on the Grand Central Parkway in New York City, just past Shea Stadium, home of the New York Mets and then the New York Jets, past Flushing Park, and traffic came to a stop. Now, when you're, when you're the pastor of a small church, and in New York City, a small church is 250 people, so I, I had a church of about 190. You do, you do everything. Open the doors, lock the doors, buy the flowers, you know, you do everything. So I, I was in Brooklyn buying the flowers for Mother's Day. You know, we always give mothers the flowers, the red flowers, the white flowers. So I had a car full of flowers, and I need to admit something to you. I, I was not yet married, and I said, as a pastor, I want to have one sports car before I have to settle down and, and be married. So I, I was driving a, a 280Z. You know, anybody know what a 280Z is? I bought a 280Z. And um, so my car is full of flowers, a two-seater sports car. Um, um, and traffic came to a total stop. And I could see the flashing lights. And um, everybody turned off there. And we were just sitting in the parkway for a long period of time, at least 30 minutes before I got out. And a policeman came to me, and he saw the little clergy sticker on my, on my car. He said, could you come real quick? I need you to give somebody last rites. And I explained to him that I was a Protestant minister. We don't do that but I will pray for whoever uh, needs it. And by the time I got there, and I, I need to warn you, this is going to be a little gory, but it's, every word is true. By the time he guided me through all of the mangled cars and everything else to this, to this car where the fellow was, he had already expired. Now let me tell you what happened and why I've kept this for 40 years. Evidently, two young people, three young people, because there's one, someone in the back seat, um, got to drinking and wanted to see how fast their automobile would go. The policeman estimated that when the car crossed over into oncoming traffic, they were doing about 110 miles an hour. The car sheared off the roof of the first car it hit. It just took the roof off and decapitated the husband and wife who were sitting in the, the front seat. And then it came to rest in the chest of the driver of this Jaguar that had that bumper sticker on it. This was 40 years ago. And I can remember this incident as clearly as if it were this past Friday night. In the car that had no roof, I asked the policeman, what is this lumpy stuff? 
that's all over the back seat. He said to me, those are the brains of those two people who are in the, the front seat. Now, in today's economy, with all of the terrorism, you don't get that kind of access to a crime scene like that. But back in 1978, they did. He asked me to come around, and as I walked around the car, and I said, this is gory, so I'm not going to apologize for it. There lying in front of me on the ground was a human head, separated from the body, and just a little of the spinal cord hanging out. And I almost stepped on it. And that sight has been etched in my brain for 40 years. I've never forgotten it. As we walked around the scene, and there were some other minor injuries, and, and uh, another pastor came, and we were praying with people and, and the whole thing, and a policeman just broke down in tears, and I took him aside, and we prayed. Um, the, the, the smell of death was there. And on the back of that Jaguar, where this, this car was sitting literally in the man's chest, it was in the front, it had gone through the windshield and pinned him in the car. On the back of that expensive car was this bumper sticker. Get it through your head, Jesus is dead. And when I saw it, I had to have it. I said, I'm taking that. So I went back to my car, got a little scraper thing out of my glove box, and I came and I knelt down, and I carefully, it was longer than this. This is the, all I could salvage. Uh, I carefully peeled this off. And the policeman came along, because it's a crime scene. And he saw me, and he looked at me, and he uttered a little expletive. And I don't know if he was expletiving this or expletiving me. I didn't care because I was taking this. And um, he didn't stop me. He shook his head and he just walked away. And every now and again, I pull this out and just look at it. Because it has served for the past 40 plus years as motivation for what I do. Because there are people out there who believe that Jesus is dead, or that he never lived, or that he never existed, or that he's not coming back. And I said, if a wealthy man dressed in a suit and tie and driving an expensive car can have this on his bumper sticker, then we as children of God have got a lot of work to do. Amen? Amen. So he's been dead 40 years, and Jesus is still very much alive. Amen? Amen? That's why we do what we do, because we serve a risen Savior. Amen? Amen? 40 years, just like yesterday. And I've never had this out of my sight for too long, and uh, I can't find my high school diploma. <laughs> I can't find my master's degree diploma. I can't even find the, the, the stuff for the, for the PhD. I don't know where any of that stuff is, but I know where this is. I, I don't know where my, where my ordination papers are, Pastor. Lost them, but I haven't lost this. Because this is a statement that God's people have some work to do. Amen? And while on others, thou art preaching, do not become castaways. So the word of God is powerful, is living, is breathing, and gives us light. And so I say to you again, what would it be like if everybody obeyed the word of God. What kind of world would it be? I've had three cars stolen. 
not at 3ABN, all while I was pastoring in New York City. As I said the other night, I, I did 117 funerals at one church. What would it be like if everybody followed the word of God? You didn't have to lock your door. You didn't have to guard your money so closely. I had a credit card. What's the word you, when somebody steals your identity? They, they take your card and start charging stuff. Yeah, identity thing. So it's Pastor Loma Kang, same thing. We were heading to Israel in November, and my wife put in her rollerboard iPad, her work computer, the camera I bought her for her birthday, some other stuff. Turned her back for a minute, walked away. What would it be like if everybody just followed the word of God? If everybody just kept the Ten Commandments. A couple years ago, well, more than that now, I came home from a funeral. There was a fellow sitting, slouched down in a car in front of my house. And I noticed that my front door was open. Didn't leave it open. So as I came into the driveway, this car took off. And as I was going in my door, out came a guy with my television set. My, well, back then they had um, VHS recorders. And since I was working in, in um, communications for the conference, I had two or three of those. They belonged to the conference, two or three television sets. And um, so I put my foot against the door. And I said, uh, is the owner here? <laughs> and the person said, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just picking up some stuff I left here. <laughs> I said, I'm the owner. Threw all the stuff down, TV, VCRs, and of course they wanted to crash, and headed out to the back of the house. So now I'm in the house chasing that person. And as we're going through the house, my, my mind is picking up cues of all the stuff that's not there anymore that used to be there. TVs in the living room, there were three of them because I was doing editing. They're all gone. The edit control system, that's gone. They, they even stole my cologne. <laughs> so out the back they went and around the side of the house, and I know I was going to catch them because I've got a pretty good sized fence, and there are there was rose bushes along the side of the house. I knew where they were, the person didn't. So they plowed into all those thorny rose bushes. I grabbed them by the jacket, had one of those jean jackets, wriggled out of the jean jacket. And they had a long white shirt, so I grabbed the tail of the shirt. It was that point when the hat flew off that I realized the he was a she. who wriggled out of the shirt. So the jacket's gone, and the shirt is gone. So we're down to, <laughs> praise the Lord. So she jumped the fence, and she was pretty scratched up by the time. I jumped the fence, and I just tackled her. Down to the ground we went. And she's wriggling, and and I'm got her in this hole, and I'm screaming for my next door neighbor to come call the police. Um, and it was a rather revealing experience. <laughs> the police come, they put her in a squad car, um, hands behind her back, and they never did cover her up. And then we went through the whole list. They had cleaned me out. They had been there for a long time. 
And I looked down the street, and there at the intersection I could see, because the car had this one headlight out, I said, that's the guy. So the police fanned out, and they got him. And it's interesting because they lived next door, this couple, to another Adventist pastor, a friend of mine who's now the conference secretary. I said, why didn't they break into his house? <laughs> and when we went for the grand jury, they had been stealing for months and months and months and warehousing all of these things in the grandfather's house. And there were tens of thousands of dollars worth of stolen goods. I say again, what would it be like if everybody just kept the commandments of God? What kind of world would it be? What kind of wonderful world indeed it is? would be. Let's look at the nature of the word. And we won't keep it too long tonight. Just a few more texts. The word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my feet. The word illuminates you. The, Lord, the word will tell you what to do and what not to do. Amen? Amen. It'll keep you from stumbling in the ditch. If you follow the word of God, I have a sermon called The Land of No Regrets. And the basic premise is the quicker you get to God, the less regrets you have. Amen. Amen. And one regret you will never have is giving your life to the Lord. Does anybody know that's true? Anybody ever gave their heart to Jesus and said, I'm really sorry I did that? No. The only regret you have when you give your heart to the Lord is that you waited so long to do it. Amen. The land of no regrets. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. The word of God is eternal. And does not pass and is a blessing in all generations. Psalms 33, 6, I think, is my next one. That's what I want. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of... So the word of God is active and alive. And when the word comes into your life, you become active and alive. Amen. Good text. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is like my mother used to be when she used to come and visit me before I was married as a single pastor. My mother worked in the x-ray department of Buffalo General Hospital for many years. She is what is called a neat freak. <laughs> Can smell out dirt. So when I knew my mother was coming to visit me, I would pre-clean the house <laughs> because I didn't want her to find anything. Now, my, my mother was born in Toronto, Canada. She's very British. Uh, never raised, it, raised her voice. When my father and mother used to have arguments, we didn't really know because they were so polite. And so <laughs> they spoke so, you really need to stop that. <laughs> Why? Well, I'm, I'm getting the slightest bit irritated. Very, very British. Never, my father's from Barbados. Uh, uh, very gentlemanly West Indian fellow. Never raised his voice. We didn't hear hollering in our house. Uh, you could tell by the tone something was going on, but there was never any raised voice. And so she was a, 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 a hospital person. You, you knew my mom. Um, very, very neat. Uh, very organized. Very orderly. Loved being a Seventh-day Adventist. And she would come to visit me take off her coat and hat, and immediately begin cleaning. 
the most aggravating thing. <laughs> Cleaning and enjoying it. She'd go in the kitchen, and, and, and she would go on top of the refrigerator. <laughs> Who cleans on top of the refrigerator? Or, or move the refrigerator. It's a little while moving the refrigerator, looking for dirt, and just as pleased, and, and just cleaning, clean. Oh, you forgot that. <laughs> the Word of God is just like that. It is. Once it comes into your life, it begins cleaning. Amen. 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 And it keeps on cleaning till the day you die. Amen. Kathy, it will tell you, you missed a spot. <laughs> you thought you had that covered, but you missed a spot. And then it will assist you in cleaning that spot up. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It even cleans up your brain. Amen. 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 Yeah. You in church, you're praising the Lord, and you haven't taken care of something else, and the Holy Spirit will nag you and say, you need to handle that before your worship is truly acceptable. Amen? Amen. Amen. The thoughts and intents of the heart. I have to tell a story on my wife because my wife is pretty, is pretty cool person. Her fuse is much shorter than mine. But she calms down much quicker than I do. Yeah, my wife, when she says it, she's done. It takes me a long time to get there, but I stay there a little longer. Amen. Yeah. Once she says it, she's finished. She's ready to huggle and cuddle. I'm like, give me a second here. You know, I... The Latina thing. Yes, the Latina, it is that Latina thing. Very much so. Because her sister's like that, her other sister's like that, and her brother's like that. It's a Latina thing. But the spirit will even clean up. It will lengthen your fuse. Amen. It'll, it'll, it'll give you the ability to put up with some stuff that you couldn't put up before. You see, here's the thing about, about, about serving the Lord. When you're focused on where you're going, you can put up with the bumps in the road that come while you're trying to get there. Does that make sense? Because the bumps are going to come. So don't, don't, don't fool yourself. Do not deceive yourself into thinking that everything is going to be smooth for you. Forget that. It's not. The devil's going to send some. And the Lord is going to allow some. So between the two, you're going to get some. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you're going to get some. But when you're focused on your destination, you can deal with that stuff. Because you're focused on where you're going. Amen. Amen. Everybody's going to get some bumps. Yeah, you're going to get some. You may get them from your husband. You may get them from your wife. You may get them from your family. You may get it from other church members. But God is going to give you the strength to deal with that stuff Amen. because you're heading towards the kingdom. And so the word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not just their heart, your heart. Because the heart is desperately wicked. Remember I talked to you about blowing smoke up your own nose the other night? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can fool yourself. But you can't fool God. And you're, you see, here's the thing. Once you say, I have decided to follow Jesus, guess what the devil said? I've decided you're not going to follow Jesus. And so the battle begins. And how long does that battle last? Till the day you close your eyes. And the day you think, I got this, the devil is there to tell you, no, you don't. You need to hold on to Jesus. So the word is a discerner. It's, it's, it's trying to tell you about you. And let me add this, and this is not, again, forgive me, this is ecclesiological obedictum, just eschatological gastroenteritis. This, this, is, this is every time you have a disagreement with somebody, every time you stub your toe, that is a call from God for you to check yourself out. Amen. Amen. Galatians says, but let a man examine other people. Mm -hmm. Examine himself. Every time you have a fight with somebody you love, examine you. Because you can't change them. Only person you can change 
is you. Amen. Amen. So every time you run into a brick wall, examine yourself. Amen. Amen. In the light of the word, which is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I just took five minutes of your time, and I apologize because it wasn't in my notes. 1 Corinthians 2.13, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Compare spiritual things with spiritual. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned, which is why you should never open the word of God without praying. Amen. 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 And you will forgive my pejorative English, you ain't smart enough to discern the word of God without prayer. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So you can read something in the natural and get it all confused. And then pray about it, and the Lord will make it plain. Amen? Because he's not trying to hide anything from you. He wants you to know. But spiritual things are spiritually discerned. There's a great text in 1 John. I think it's the first chapter, or it's 5, 7 where it says, I write no new thing unto you. And then he says, again, I write a brand new thing. And somebody came to me, Pastor, this doesn't make any sense. I write no new thing, and again, I write a new thing. And I told him, here's what John is saying. Christ is saying, and John is interpreting, I'm not giving you anything brand new. I'm giving you something that's new to you. Real simple. And this person is all confused, ready to leave the church, all mad at the Lord. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. If you buy a, a, a used car, is that car new? No, it's you. Is it new to you? Yeah, yeah that's what Christ is saying. Amen. Not new, but it's new to you. So don't, get, yeah, don't get, all, get all upset. Pray about it. Then open the word. And never open the word without prayer. That's it we got. John 7, 17. If anyone wills to do it, so. Now this is an interesting text. This is counterintuitive. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. What? If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know. Now that seems backwards. If you say, fix my car, I would say, teach me, and I'll do it. I don't know how to fix cars. You have to show me. But this is saying, I can fix the car, then I will know how to do it. Yeah. Will to do, then no. It should be no, then do, right? No. Will, then no. Now, what's the Bible saying? Not that tough. You see, God doesn't want to waste your time. When you go to the Lord, you need to go with a willing heart. It's Acts, and I don't remember. No, it's 1 Corinthians. It says, but first there must be a willing mind. So when you go to the Lord in prayer or reading the word, you have to have a willing heart. In other words, before you go to God, you've got to make up in your mind that whatever God tells you to do, that is what you will do. Amen? Amen. And if you don't plan on doing what he says, why are you going to him? Does that make sense? Yeah, you're going to fall on your knees in prayer and ask God for stuff, but you're going to say, okay, Lord, give me heaven's complete attention, but I don't plan on doing anything that you ask me to do. So the Bible says there's got to be first a willing mind. If anyone wills to do his will. Amen? Amen? Yeah, if you want to do it, then God is going to make sure you know exactly what to do. And of course, we said before, doctrine is how you conduct your life under Jesus. Whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. If you want to know, God will make sure that you know. There's one prayer that God has never turned down. Lord, teach me your will. Never say no to that. Not ever. Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. Whom will he teach knowledge? 
And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, question, rhetorical, those just drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. I remember having a conversation with another pastor, and he was saying, how come you just jump all over the Bible? Because the Bible says jump all over. <laughs> yeah, that's what this text is saying. Jump everywhere you, if you want to discover what happens to people when you die. You can find that in one spot. But you never develop a doctrinal premise from one text. You know that. You don't develop a doctrinal premise. You, you develop it from many, many texts. It's like how your GPS system finds where you are by triangulating. That's what you do in the Bible. Every, before you develop a, a doctrine on what happens when you die, you go to every text in the Bible that talks about that, that doctrine. You put it in a pot, you boil it, and you make a stew. Amen. Yeah, then eat the stew. See, if you, just, if you just have water, that's not stew. That's only one text. If you, have, if you have water and beans, you're closer. It's still not stew. A little salt. I'm getting out of my league here because I don't cook. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, you put all of the ingredients together, then, I should have said cake. Yeah. <laughs> then you make your stew. Make sense? Here a little, there a little. That's how you study the word of God. Never one text. Because you can find some texts that would have you doing some crazy things if you just take that one text. You don't do that. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God which you heard from us, this is Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the what? Word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. This is the powerful thing about the Word of God. It actually does stuff to you. It, it changes you. It makes you alive. I stopped reading the Bible through about 20 years ago. I don't do it anymore. I have read through, but I don't. Because I'm, I'm, it's not my nature, and I get too much stuck on one thing. Um, Irma will tell you, I can get stuck on a word, a word, for two and three hours at a time. No one would you, you can read the Bible through in a year, stuck on one word for three hours. I'll write a sermon and write one into a word, and I'll, stay, I'll spend a whole night on one word. So I stopped reading the Bible through. I've read every book of the Bible. I've done it several times. But just to read from Genesis to Revelation, I don't do it anymore. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I don't, because I'm too anal retentive about one word. And I, God will save to the uttermost. I said on the uttermost from like 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the morning, just on the uttermost. Uttermost means any time, any place, anywhere, in any situation, always, ever, every, any. There's about 25 different things the word uttermost. Great, great, great word, which means you cannot run too far or too fast to get away from Jesus. Amen. But it took me five hours to get that down. <laughs> so it is effective for those who believe. Psalms 19.7. The law of the Lord is? Perfect. What does it do? Converts your soul. That's what the word of God does. It converts your soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. making wise. There is a spiritual writer who is my favorite. Her name is Ellen White. She says this. She says Bible study will increase your intelligence. Amen. Not just reading it, studying it, spending time with it. So you may not be the sharpest knife in a drawer. You may not, you know, think you can keep up. Study the word of God. Make you smart. Amen. 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 Yeah. It'll make you smart. It will help you to retain. Oops. I want to go there. Having been born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the, again, word of God, which lives and abides forever. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, and with all un ooh. 
No, I know that you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, which why it's forever. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Take it in little, little bites. We have a saying at 3ABN, Danny Sheldon says, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Yeah, one bite at a time. Same with the word of God. You don't need to study vast chapters. Just take a little bit and study it, and you'll get stronger. And then don't go to the, the most obscure, toughest, toughest text. Don't, don't start out with 144,000 from Revelation chapter 4. <laughs> don't start there. Start with something easy, like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen? You can bite down on that. But don't, don't start with, you know, Revelation. Uh, you can get to that when you get big and strong and build some muscles. But don't start off, that, that will crush you if you start with Revelation. Start with something nice like John. John is a wonderful book. Tell you something about the book of John. Uh, uh, forgive me. Can you uh, forgive me? John, the book of John, is a touchless gospel. In the book of John, all of the miracles are by remote control. Yeah, Christ doesn't touch anybody in the book of John. He doesn't. If they're all remote control miracles. In other words, Christ says something over here, and somebody gets healed over there. Amen. Yeah, it's all remote control stuff. No, no, no direct, you know, you, you have this thing where Christ laid his hand on the person and says, by, by, you know, your faith has made thee whole. Not in John, all remote stuff. The only one that's even close is when the woman touched the hem of his garden. But she touched him, he didn't touch her. Amen. All the miracles are remote control. This, this guy comes up, this, this guy comes up and says, my daughter's dying. Okay, go home, she's healed. <laughs> Remote control. Wonderful book, the book of John. Um, and, and the book of John was written long after everybody who knew Christ died. That's why he starts off with the word, and the word is with God, and the word was God. John is trying to tell us that when you've got the word, it's as good as having Jesus there personally. Because every, John wrote, in, wrote the book of John in about 90 A.D. Christ died in 34. So Christ was long since dead. And everybody that knew Christ personally was also dead. So John is writing for the second generation after Christ had died. So he's really writing to you and me. That's why he starts with the word. If you got the word, you got Jesus. Amen? Amen? He's talking about the power of the word. So all of the miracles are remote control. Because John is trying to say... You don't have to have Jesus standing right before you. If you got the word, you got the miracle working power of that word. Amen. 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 Powerful book of John. And it's easy to read. Start with John. And then go backwards. Luke, Matthew, Mark. Mark is another really good book. I could give you a whole 20 minutes on Mark, too. And Matthew also. Then work your way towards Revelation. Then by the time you get Revelation, your muscles will be strong. Amen. Amen. Uh, and with all unrighteousness and deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. You've got to love the word as you love the author of the word. And as you do so, the word will become strong. Spend little time in the word every single day. And God will give you blessings. He will give you peace for that day. He will give you sustenance for that day. He will give you power for that day. And you should never, ever leave home without it. Now, let me close with this one thought. I said the other night that um, one-third of the Bible was written by men who had given or taken someone's life. And someone challenged me, and so here is the proof. Books one through five called the Pentateuch, written by who killed and, and buried him in the murderer. David wrote the Psalms. There are two Psalms that they say are not Davidic, but let's, let's get into better for the doubt. 150 Psalms. David was responsible for the death of... Now, he didn't kill him, but he sent the order to kill him. That's the same thing. All right, I've, I've got a, a, a book I'm writing called Arguing with God. And this whole second half deals with David, Uriah, Bathsheba. There's a lot of interesting things there that are just below the surface. Uh, but David, too, is a murderer. Solomon, after the death of David, 
ordered the death of Adonijah. In fact, Adonijah was clinging to the horns of the altar, which is supposed to be sanctuary. He said, go in and get him anyway. So Solomon wrote Songs of Solomon. He wrote Ecclesiastes. He wrote Lamentations. Murderer. Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. 21 out of the 66 are Pauline books. Paul admits, I persecuted Christians. And if you look at the word, he's talking about persecute, not just, I didn't just harass them and throw pies in their face, I killed them. Here's the message. When you read that one-third of the Bible was, was written by murderers, that gives me hope. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. If God can, can, can reclaim murderers, yeah. anybody else? Yeah. You can reclaim me. I've not gone too far. In that prison two years ago, I baptized 11 men who will never come out of prison because they're all murderers. They're all murderers. And some of them not willingly. There's a fellow, bless his heart, he was in a bar. He shouldn't have been there. He should have been going to church. There was a fellow who was bugging him, and he just, he just, he, he said to me, I just wanted him to leave me alone. So I grabbed him, and I threw him down, and I went home. And about an hour later, the police came and knocked on my door and said, that fellow you threw to the ground, you fractured his skull. You're coming with us. Wife, two kids. You will never see them again, except through glass bars. But I baptized him. He's a member of the family of God. Amen. Never get out, but he's free. Because the Bible said, he whom the Son has made free is free indeed. So the power of the word has set him free, although he will die in prison. We serve a powerful God, Amen. a wonderful God, and his word is freeing, and his word is true. And if we will live by that word, then when Jesus comes, we will see him in peace. That last text I didn't give you the reference for is John 8, 36. He whom therefore the Son has set free is free indeed. That's a part of the word. Amen? amen? And amen. If you have your decision cards, and of course we use these for the gifts um, that come out nightly, put your name down if you will. Was the topic clear? Do you understand the power of the word? Would you like additional information on the topic? You will get that at the door. The text I used and additional text. It is my intention to follow him. Now I'm going to ask it this way. If this word means something to you and you plan on doing his will, would you stand with me? You plan on doing his will. As you read it and understand it, you want to do it. Because righteousness is right doing. Not just right thinking, not just right planning, it's right doing. Amen? Amen. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you this night for this opportunity to look into your word and the power of your word. Help us to feed on the word and to get that life-giving power that can only come from reading and hearing and doing your word. Let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we surrender ourselves to you and ask you to fill us with your spirit and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. We'll see you on tomorrow night.